Welcome to Theological Table Talk. This is the podcast of the Center for Christian Studies. Uh, my name is Keith Stanglin. I'm the director of the Center for Christian Studies, and I'm joined as usual uh, by Todd Hall, the associate director of the Center. Todd, hi. good to see you. Right. Hi. Yes. <laughs> How's it going? <laughs> Not too bad. Not All too right. Bad. Well, we're excited today to be joined in this episode by Kevin Burr and Luke Dockery. Um, Kevin is uh, the discipleship minister at the King's Crossing Church of Christ in Corpus Christi, Texas. Luke Dockery is the youth and family minister at the Cloverdale Church of Christ in Searcy, Arkansas. So glad to have them with us today. And uh, we're particularly going to be talking about um, their ministry of Regnum Media, um, which has joined forces with the Center for Christian Studies. We're going to talk a little bit about that and also um, just about education in churches. Our context is Churches of Christ, um, but we want to talk about education programs, uh, which tend to be Sunday school, don't have to just be limited to that, but we're looking forward to this conversation. So welcome, guys. And um Kevin, I'll start with you. Is there something, uh, anything else you want to tell us about yourself? Did I get your church right there? How long you did? You? Okay. Yes. Uh, tell us just briefly your academic background and kind of um, your role in that congregation. How long you've been there? That sort of. Thing. Yeah. Um, after after thinking for a while that I wanted to teach high school history and social studies. All it took was uh, for me to step foot into a high school during pre-student teaching, not even real student teaching, pre-student teaching, <laughs> for me to have this unshakable sense that this was not for me, uh, despite having come from a, a family full of teachers. And uh, through the uh, through the likes of influential professors and, and mentor figures, at Harding University, where I was currently working on a master's, uh, or at that time working on a master's of science and education, um, a wonderful gentleman by the name of Paul Pollard helped to me uh, see that, you know, I, I should continue theological education. I had minored in New Testament Greek, and, and uh, another professor friend who also happens to be my uh, my compatriot's uh, older brother, Dr. Jared Dockery. History professor at Harding University, he uh, he encouraged me to um, continue pursuing what really at that time was just a love of New Testament Greek, that blossomed into a Master's of Divinity at Harding School of Theology in Memphis, where I later got a PhD in Biblical Studies from Asbury Theological Seminary in Kentucky, and uh, saw at the uh, church that I worked at in Kentucky saw the real need for. Uh, not just knowing Bible content, and uh, which for for uh, several members, well-meaning, but uh, for several members, was largely rooted in Bible trivia, like knowing you know, peculiar facts here and there. Uh, uh, by no means everybody, but th that was how in previous generations they had been taught to read the Bible. Mm -hmm. Saw yeah. that you know it was it was just teaching the Bible and, and learning it. And, uh, you know, what it meant in its original context and, and how we apply it today, that was incredibly important. So now, as the discipleship minister, I like to joke that it is essentially an associate minister position with a more biblical title. I don't, I don't see the word associate anywhere in the New Testament. Am I right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> We're calling Bible things by Bible names. That's right. That's right. And, um, no, but as a discipleship minister... One of my main goals, uh, one of my main focuses here is adult education, and that looks like coordinating and planning adult Bible classes and, uh, you know, the occasional seminar or, you know, other things like that here and there. And so this is a topic that's very, very close to my heart and has been for a long time. All right. Thank you, Kevin. Um, very good. Uh, Luke, tell us about uh, your uh, academic background and your current ministry role. <laughs> Uh, yes, uh, glad to be here and and able to to talk about this, enjoying our partnership together. Uh, so I am also a Harding University graduate. Uh, Kevin and I overlapped there. Though he's a couple of years younger than I was, but we were we were friends at Harding. Um, I was actually not a Bible major 
either. Um, <clears throat> I was an international business and Spanish major. Uh, I did do some summer youth ministry internships um, and kind of at some doors closed and others opened. And I, I found myself in youth ministry. Not all of us can avoid teaching teenagers like Kevin did. Uh, <laughs> and so, uh, so yeah, I, I, I launched into to youth ministry. Um, didn't have a lot of training other than being kind of like a preacher's kid and, and going to Harding and, and the Bible classes that came with that. And so I began an MDiv at HST as well, Master of Divinity degree. I actually started before Kevin and finished after Kevin because uh, he, he did it quickly and I did it slowly from a distance. Um, as I did that, my, my role at my congregation had grown. I had the less biblical title of associate minister. Uh, and so I was doing, I was doing youth ministry, but I was doing a lot of other things too. And, uh, one of those was, I ended up kind of overseeing our adult education program and, uh, just became aware at that time of a significant need for better, better resources, um, a, a overall, a higher level of quality in our classes. And also, um, we just had a lot of people who didn't feel really well equipped to teach. And so that was kind of a seed that was planted with me. I was always looking for good material, good resources that I could hand off to someone who didn't feel comfortable developing their own. Uh, in 2019, <clears throat> um, my family moved to Searcy, Arkansas, where I uh, began working with the Cloverdale Church here in Searcy as the youth and family minister. So here my role is uh, a little more specific. I'm not over adult education, though I'm, I'm still involved in conversations about those things. Uh, while I was here, a pandemic occurred, and um, it just became very clear to me during the pandemic that we had lots of people, lots of Christian people who had spent years and years in churches uh, who held views that were not deeply formed by Scripture. Um and that there was just kind of a lot of a lot of ideas being thrown around, a lot of uh, kind of bickering, honestly, back and forth between kind of different different groups of people based on mm -hmm. uh, you know just different ideologies that were out there. And it was just clear to me that uh, many of us had been discipled very well, but not by Jesus. Yeah. Um, and, and so I, I just became con like convinced that what you know that at least part of the the part of the solution to this problem has to be some better teaching that's not all of it but but some better teaching and, and teaching that perhaps better understands what's going on in scripture but also better better connects it to our lives and what that looks like lived out as disciples of jesus um and so kevin and i at, at this point kevin had, had transitioned and he was uh down um in corpus christi and was very interested in in thinking about things like adult bible classes and we just started kind of brainstorming you know what can we do um in, in this time where people have resources, um, they have access to lots of stuff, but it's not all good stuff. What can we do to try to provide some um, some resources that are scholarly informed, but also accessible um, that people could actually pick up and read or use in a Bible class setting that would be helpful to them? And that's kind of how we started uh, dreaming of Regnum Media. Good. Um your title, I think I noticed this, is Youth in Family Minister. Is that right? Did I see that correctly? Yeah, um, that's not correct. Youth, not youth and family, in family. Of it, so, did you choose that? Is there? I'm assuming yeah. there's some significance there. You just want to talk about that? Yeah, so. yeah. It's a dangerous question because you basically invited me to step onto my personal soapbox. <laughs> you have 30 <laughs> seconds. You have 30 seconds. <laughs> So in, in short, uh, I'm a youth minister. I believe in the value of youth ministry. Unfortunately, I think the, the way that youth ministry is, is frequently practiced is not really supported by scripture and turns out to be pretty ineffective. And, and that traditional model tends to be um, isolating young people from the rest of the church and kind of outsourcing their spiritual formation to a youth minister rather than that being, uh, you know, the primary responsibility of the parents. Cool. And so um, we try to do youth ministry in a context where we uh, combine the strengths of the local church and uh, the parents 
to produce long lasting faith in young people. So that looks like trying to connect kids to the church. It looks like trying to uh, equip parents to better disciple their own kids. And so it's, as my title goes, um, I'm not conceiving of youth ministry as one thing and family ministry as something else that are just kind of peripherally connected, but rather uh, we want to minister to young people in the context of family. So youth in family, uh, where family is both their physical families, but also the faith family, which is yeah. the church. And we think that's a more biblical model. And also research indicates that it leads to better long-term faith outcomes for students as well. Excellent. Um, you And you did that in maybe not 30 seconds, but about 60, I think. So that was <laughs> really well done. And uh, that makes me think we need to schedule a podcast for uh, yeah. Luke to tell us more about youth and family ministry. I think that's... I, yeah, I love that. Luke is on all the top podcasts. I'm just going to throw that out there. <laughs> and okay. now he's on, yes. not a top podcast. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's going to help this be a top podcast. <laughs> right, yeah. Come on. Um, so um, you guys were at Harding University as students and overlapped at the end of your time there, I think, just when I began teaching there. And that you reminded me just now that you were not um, majors in the College of Bible and Religion uh, reminds me of why I didn't know you uh, well uh, then. Though I knew you on the Frisbee Ultimate Frisbee field, uh, but outside of that, not too much. All right. Do y'all, do y'all still play Frisbee? In my heart. <laughs> <laughs> Spiritually, I'm there. Uh, I still play in a much less platonic sense than that. Uh, but basically in the, in the summers, I, I play summer league, and that's that's fun. But I'm also oh, – nice. 39 is, is old – for ultimate frisbee playing and so oh, I, I still do wow. it but i'm not, years to get. not at the same level come on <laughs> come on well uh thanks guys um I, I would like for you to just tell us more about um regnum media uh the background give us the origin story um and uh, up to today or at least the time we started collaborating so i know it goes back a long time um luke you want to take that or uh, yeah, so it, it's kind of been a kernel of an idea for a while. Um, a few years ago now, when Kevin was still in Kentucky, uh, he actually brought me in his church to do like a, a youth in family ministry seminar. And while there, I kind of had pitched an idea for a book project with him. He he was in the middle that time of working on his dissertation. So he was kind of, kind of swallowed up in things, but I kind of dangled it as a carrot, like, hey, wouldn't this be fun to work on once you do your work that you're supposed to do? Um, and so we, we just kind of talked about that. And then ultimately, uh, I moved not super long after that, and um, pandemic broke out, and then Kevin moved. And so there's just a lot going on. Um, and it was during that time, during the pandemic, that I just became convicted, like, oh, my goodness, we, we've got to do better than this. Um, as Christians, we need to be able to for lack of a better term, behave better in the world mm. um, and, and just have more uh, a, a more bu- robust biblical and theological foundation for the way we express ourselves and interact with other people and interact with uh, very real problems that are going on in the world. And I kind of uh, just kind of pitched it to Kevin. And at that point, you know, he's he's actively now in the trenches working on, OK, I've got to come up with multiple adult Bible classes and I need teachers and we need to have topics that we can teach. And what does that look like? Um, and so we, we kind of dabbled, or, you know, just talked about a lot of things like, hey, maybe this could look like uh, like some online video modules for courses. Maybe this could look like uh I don't know if we ever talked about a podcast, but maybe this could maybe this could look like books. And, and we kind of settled on well, maybe we'll do a lot of stuff. But to start with, a good way to kind of enter into that would be through publishing adult Bible class material that churches could use. Um, and I had had some experience doing that um, from a youth ministry perspective. I work with a another group that does that for youth ministry um, called Deeper Youth Ministry, and we produce some resources and books. So I had some experience, um, but w- we didn't want to do the same thing, but we noticed the need for adults. And so uh, we just talked about, hey, if we could get some 
from our contacts, people that we know, people who are well trained, who would who also love the church and would like to have really good resources in the hands of Bible class teachers. And then if we could maybe write them in such a way that if I didn't want to take it, if it wasn't as part of a Bible class, I could still read it as part of my own personal devotion and discipleship, um, it could be useful. And so that was kind of where we started. Um, and we were kind of brainstorming that and had kind of started uh, reaching out to some different folks and had had some projects we were working on. Um, and then kind of out of the blue, uh, we learned that another group was interested in doing the same sort of thing. Um, but before we transition to that, maybe Kevin might have some some things to add from his perspective as to how all that began. Yeah, thanks, Luke. Um, it, you described it pretty well that, um, you know, I was in the trenches trying to uh, suggest good Bible class curriculum, or, or really at a very practical level, books that I knew either because I had read or knew the author, I knew of the author's work, that I could uh, comfortably and confidently recommend to you know, certain teachers of ours to take that book and make it into a, you know, a quarter long, like a three month long Bible class on a Sunday morning. And I, I very quickly exhausted the list of books that I personally had been able to work through that I felt comfortable recommending to uh, to somebody, because whenever you recommend a book to somebody, right, you know, there's always you know, there's always a line in there that you forgot about, and you know, somebody reads it and thinks, oh, does he does he agree with this? It's like, well, I mean, do I have to tell you that I don't agree with everything in the book, right? Okay, so there's it just at a very at a very real uh, practical level. I felt a strong need for things that I could very comfortably recommend to uh, to people. And um, as Luke and I started talking about this, uh, th I think this is getting down to where you were going to uh, end up there, Luke. We were thinking, who are people we know that if, if they had if they had curriculum or material on you know this or that book of the Bible, Old or, Old or New Testament or whatever, that we would say, yeah, I feel really confident that this is going to be great stuff, <laughs> that you're really, that you Bible class teacher, whoever you are, that you would really enjoy reading this material. I reached out to a, a particular friend of ours, an Old Testament professor, and uh, he had apparently expressed interest in the same kind of thing to Center for Christian Studies. And I think that overlap in, you know, the people that Luke and I were thinking of, and apparently the people that Center for Christian Studies was thinking of, that kind of got us on each other's radar for, okay, there's there's something here, obviously, you know, independent, you know, independent parties are aware that there's a need for this kind of thing. And uh, that was, I think, what sparked the initial conversations between between Keith and Todd and uh, and Luke and myself. Yeah, uh, I think that's a good description of it. Um, we, uh, when I was talking to, it was Lance Holly uh, at Harding School of Theology, and uh, he gave me a curriculum that we wanted to uh, publish. And then I saw him again three months later, and I uh, said, sorry, I haven't uh, made any progress <laughs> with your curriculum yet. But we're still hoping to publish it. And he said, oh, hey, uh, Kevin uh, Kevin Burr has uh, asked me about this, too. Y'all may be working on similar things. Yeah, so from my perspective, I just thought um, these are good guys, and we're seeking similar, and in this case, the same author. <laughs> uh, and so we probably have similar purposes in mind. Um, we could do this independently and... Uh, produce two different sets of books that are helpful for the church, or we could talk about collaborating and uh, do the same thing, but maybe do it better. So, um, yeah, that's uh, I think a kind of how it started. If I could, if I could interject something, uh, yeah. as as y'all were talking, I remembered I have a memory. Kevin and I were meeting on my back deck during Harding's lectureship. He was in town for that, and I, I remember at that point. This is before we had talked at all. And I remember specifically saying, 
Now, there's these guys at Center for Christian Studies, and they're doing some really cool stuff. And at that point, you had you had started the journal, and I had subscribed to it, and I was I was liking what I was what I was seeing, and I said, but it looks like they're doing largely like video stuff. So we don't want to do what they're doing, but I you know I, I think there's a need for Bible class books, and so it was interesting. So from the beginning, um, I was aware of you all, and really didn't want to tread the same ground, but, but was unaware that you were looking to expand into kind of the the publishing side of things. So it really worked out well in terms of, um, you know, collaboration rather than competition. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's a validation there. I was thinking about, you know, for those of us in ministry, you're, you're not isolated. You know, it feels sometimes like you are like, uh, man, am I the only one who can't find quality education materials, you know? Um, and you know, you're not, but, um, I I thought it was just so interesting that here you have two independent groups working on the same stuff at the same time. You know, um, it was just really really validating in terms of the mission. I think of both of us, and so it just made sense. Collaboration just made perfect sense. Yeah, and for us, books was always part of it, but it is the as I've told others, it's the longest thing to produce <laughs> of all the things that we do. So videos you can get uh, out, you know, all these things take preparation, journal articles, uh, videos, uh, live instruction, but books take the longest from, uh, you know, conception through gestation uh, to birth, uh, <laughs> nine months. What a, be, what a metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> Nine months to be short <laughs> for a book. So, uh, yeah. yes, you have heard that metaphor for books before, right? Okay. Uh, well, no, uh, you should copyright that. It's really good. Yeah. Uh, Not everybody's written as many books as you have, Keith. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> D- didn't invent that one. No. Um, uh, I want to talk later uh, in a little bit, maybe more specifically about some of the books that we've got coming out, but um just want to pick y'all's brains for a little bit, just in general about the current state of education programs in churches. So it sounds like uh, you've both been thinking about this for a long time and been, as you say, in the trenches um, on all of this. So what are some of the challenges? What are some of the successes uh, you've seen? I'm interested also just in your descriptions when you talk about, uh, for example, biblical literacy. Kevin, you said, you know, you've run into a lot of people over the years who think that biblical literacy is about something like uh, Bible trivia, you know, knowing the answers to the Bible Bowl questions. And I've certainly seen classes that were conducted in that fashion. Um, Luke, you mentioned, and I'd like for you at some point here to explore this a little more, um, that you ran into a lot of people whose uh, views were not, I think you said, not formed by Scripture or, uh, yeah, not very scripturally or biblically informed, perhaps. Um, so maybe y'all could just talk about that a little bit. Uh, what, what have been the challenges and maybe some of the successes? Um, I, I have s- seen, um, by virtue of being in churches, one, churches of Christ all my life, but two, uh, having attended churches that kind of run the spectrum within Churches of Christ, and for those who are familiar with Churches of Christ, right, there's your more traditionalist or sectarian or conservative churches, and you have some that are a little more ecumenical or or progressive, um, and you have some that are you know, somewhere in between those. Um, and I've I, I've attended churches that um, fall somewhere along those lines, although I. Yeah, I, I use the word progressive very, very cautiously, right? Uh, that, that's a very relative term. Um, a, a church that I would still think hits all the marks on historical orthodoxy and things along those lines, but but still a church that did some things differently than where I grew up or even where I ended up working uh, or uh, currently working. But um, within each of those settings... It, it did seem like there was, at times at least, a very noticeable way of reading the Bible 
uh, that would that would come up, and it was often what uh, you know Bible teachers and uh, you know, professors and, and scholars might call proof texting. Um, others would look at that and say, well, this is the proof of why I do X, Y, and Z. Here's the text that gives me the proof for that. So, yeah, but uh, others of us would look at that and say, well, that's that might not be wrong per se, but reading scripture in this sort of you know, haphazard way, as was demonstrated, uh, just it, or as I as I tended to see, um, led to a lot of um, really led to missing a lot of the of what it was that that the whole purpose of God's word and was about it and and everything that you could gain from that, and so I. I wanted to. Um, I, I just found myself constantly needing to um, needing to find a way to drive home that there is an overarching story, and uh, and the whole first part of the story, also called the Old Testament, is actually really important for for the New Testament, or as I like to refer to it as the good stuff. But we like there 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 was so much that we would miss if we operated just within a canon within a canon or or had our had our 20 proof texts for why we do things the way we do things i wanted to give a much much bigger much deeper much richer um experience of scripture to uh, to the places where i where i worked and worshiped yeah so just um i guess a biblical worldview um, a larger yeah. context, a knowledge of the biblical story, a lot of that is lacking. And it sounds like what you're describing, you've run into a lot over the years. Yeah. Um, Luke, what about uh, w- when you said you ran into a lot of views of people who maybe were insufficiently formed by Scripture? Do you have something? Yeah, so I, it, it's probably not a shocking revelation to state that we live in a society that's rather polarized on hmm. a host. Yeah. Right. <laughs> oh, we'll let that take. slide. We'll let that slide without hot takes uh, coming in fast. Watch without, out <laughs> without an argument. We'll just go ahead and assert it. That. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, you know, I, the, kind of a combination of, I, I think there's a lot of kind of forces that have been, brewing for a long time, but I just think that in some ways the pandemic shone a light on just a lot of things. Um, and of course, at that time, and, and still uh, have a very politically divided society, and, and you saw that really playing out, not not just in terms of politics, but also in terms of things like, how do we respond to a pandemic? Um, what do we think about vaccines? What do we, what do we think about race? Because uh, as if we didn't have enough heavy issues to deal with, uh, that was also, you know, it kind of exploding at the same time. And then, you know, ongoing issues on, on things like gender and sexuality, which are uh, just major hot button issues in our society. And what I found, and this is certainly a generalization, but what I found from just a lot of good people I knew from church contexts, um, was that, when they would share their opinions on these things frequently by means of social media, but not always, um, those opinions tended to be in lockstep with certain kind of partisan ideologies rather than something that I would say would would be or, or could be better nuanced by a deep understanding of Scripture. Um, which, you know, ultimately, I, I think the way of Jesus kind of stands in critique of all uh, human and earthly paradigms and, and worldviews. I mean, mm. I, it's not like this moderate in-between position, but it's this entirely different way of, of looking at things like power and service and submission. And um, and so ultimately, uh, I, I just became very convicted about that and not really knowing what the answer is or or, or the how, but, but being you know firmly convicted that at least part of it had to be, boy, we're, we're we're not reading our Bibles well and being formed by them. And and maybe that goes along quite well with a lot of what Kevin said. I mean, I think a lot of it is like people literally don't read them <laughs> just at all. Um, 
And then perhaps if they do, or or when they do read or when they do study, perhaps perhaps the study's not very good or they haven't been taught how to do it very well or the classes they're going to aren't very good. Um, so, so I think there's probably a lot of problems and I'm not naive enough to think that, you know, what we're hoping to do in Regnum and in partnership with CCS is just going to fix everything. But I do think that using uh, scripture to allowing it to deeply form us spiritually and to change the way we look at things is a part of the answer to this big problem that we, that we face. Yeah. Good. And maybe a more necessary thing today than it has been, at least in my lifetime. Um, you know, I, you keep hearing people talk about we're in a post Christian world. And I think that's right. I think uh, a lot of what we need to think about is, it's a it's similar, I think, to the world that Paul was operating in, but it's different because it is post Christian. Because there is this, uh, I think uh, David Bentley Hart was talking about it. I think and said, you know, you're in a culture that was Christian, so it thinks it understands what the gospel is and has now rejected it. And uh, and and in that society, when it's not either taken for granted that you're Christian such as it was even, you know, 50, 60 years ago, uh, but now is hostile uh, to Christianity as kind of anti-capital L liberal values. Um, churches have to start securing people in the biblical uh, in the biblical worldview. I hate the word worldview because it's so poorly used now, but you know, people have to start living the gospel and forming gospel communities. Otherwise, churches will not survive. Um, something else will spring up, but churches as we know it, you know, aren't going to be around. Uh, how do we get people or persuade or uh, change, I guess, this, what, what you pointed out, Luke, about people just not reading the Bible? I've... Um, as you say, this is a huge challenge, so we're not going to be able to uh, like change the culture here. But that's been one of the frustrations for me, just as a Bible class teacher in churches, where we're going through a book of the Bible, and people won't even bring Bibles to Bible class. Um, and I see it in uh, sermons. I preach every week. And I'm trying to, you know, we're going through this book of the Bible. People know that. The members know that. I've encouraged them to bring their Bible. And I'll say, okay, and I re read the text and say, okay, there in verse 8, look at this. Look back at chapter 2, verse whatever. And the vast majority don't have a Bible, and they're just looking at me. <laughs> when I say that, it's like I'm saying, look at whatever, and they're not even looking at their phone. Some of them will have it on their phone, which I, I think is not the best, but uh, they're just staring at me. And uh, well, the Church of Christ, they know Acts. Oh, sure. Yeah. They, I'm sure they all know it by heart. Yeah. If only. Uh, and it's, yeah, I don't know. It's kind of uh, a little bit deflating <laughs> for um, a minister or a Bible class teacher, I think. So, um, I don't know. How do we how do we reverse the trend one person or one congregation at a time? <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay. <That's... laughs> Maybe not. I, it, it's a big. I mean, it's a really big question, as you acknowledge. One thing, um, and I, I've done a decent amount of research on this, kind of from a, a youth ministry perspective. Um, increasingly, it's not just that people aren't reading their Bibles; it's that they are not reading right um in anything right. of significant substance i mean we read all the time on our phones but it's in a very disjointed way like scrolling through you know getting a, a basic idea of something and i, I was talking to uh, one of my elders who's done quite a, a bit of research on this and he shared the term with me uh a literacy instead of illiteracy uh so it's, it's not that people can't read but uh the notion that you know, we read all the time, like road signs and cereal boxes and things like that, but the inability to to read anything that is kind of deep and penetrating and sustained in argumentation, which is certainly scripture. I mean, goodness, that uh, 
a lot of our problems come from not reading scripture thoughtfully enough or well enough, but it's not the sort of thing that you just kind of give a cursory read over and, and get deep meaning from. And so it, I think it it's not a, a problem that is peculiar to churches in, in Bible settings. I think it's a, a widespread problem, but I do think that the Bible uh, poses particular problems for people who are used to only shallow reading now because it's not a shallow text. Um, so how do we change that? Well, uh, you know, I, I think kind of like with, with one person at a time and, uh, you know, I, I can only speak for myself. Like we in, in our teen Bible classes, we read the Bible a lot. And unlike what you can do as a preacher, it's like I can force them to have Bibles <laughs> and I can force them to put their phones away. Um, and, and so it's like I can't force them to actually read, but I can force them to open the Bible and stare at it um, as, as we read through. And so, you know, still trying to do some of those still trying to do some of those those practices. Um, and, and I do think that there are other groups. Um, so like, for example, the Bible Project, um, I think has really struck a nerve with a lot of people um, who, at, at least in terms of making the Bible more accessible, I, I guess it's impossible to know, like, is that actually leading people to read their Bibles a lot or just rely on Bible Project videos for their understanding of scripture? Mm -hmm. um, but nevertheless, I do think it, th there are resources and things out there that help provide a bridge from what might seem like a daunting and overwhelming task of reading scripture that makes it more accessible. And in some sense, right, what we're trying to do is is that too, not in the same way, but we're trying to provide a bridge that makes um, this text that may seem to be impenetrable in today's society to a lot of folks, uh, much less daunting and much more relevant perhaps than people might assume. Good. Yeah, if you're thinking impenetrable, uh, Ecclesiastes is a good one to start with. Good call. <laughs> it was a good choice. <laughs> Todd made a point earlier about uh, how how many many would say that we live in in a post Christian world, and it's a world that thinks that they understand Christianity and have rejected Christianity um, for various reasons. Um, I can't help but wonder, Luke, if if maybe we maybe sometimes we're faced with a post Bible church that we have a church that thinks it understands the Bible and therefore thinks that they might not need to continue reading the Bible. The problem is a lot of their views of what they think is in the Bible. Well, our view is not informed by Scripture, which was the very problem that you referenced earlier. So maybe we have a post-Bible church. And Keith, I'd like to put a little trademark right above that phrase, if I could. <laughs> it's all yours. Got it. Post-Bible church. Okay. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. You yeah, be you be careful can... where you put the hyphen in that. Yeah. <laughs> right. Post-Bible church is different from post-Bible church. That's right. <laughs> but I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if that's... That, I mean, it's, it's anecdotal just from my own experience, but I I see some of that before. You know, people who would say they would very readily affirm, "Yeah, I need to. I need. I should read scripture every day." Don't read scripture every day, or their reading is cursory, um, haphazard, almost. You know, I'll just let my Bible fall open mm. wherever it may be, and that is the. Lord directing me. I'm sure he does operate in that way. Sometimes he is God and I'm not, right? But yeah. I've uh, yeah, I've compared it to, uh, the the sort of post literate and, and particularly post biblical world in the way many Christians, uh, sincere devout Christians, um, interact with and engage and know the Bible. As uh, I compare that with the way I used to know Orwell's 1984 when I was a young adult before I had read it. So I know the story. It gets referred to a lot. I know what Big Brother is. I know man, that, that and maybe just a couple of other references. Two plus two equals five. I kind of know those things from that story. But that's about it. Mm. You know, I don't know the details. I don't know the story itself. I don't know the context. I don't know anything about it. 
until I sit down and actually read it carefully for myself. And it's good that I knew those references. It's good that, but I can't really say I know this. I know 1984 just because I know a couple of references about it. And I think a lot of Christians, you know, they've heard the story. They know Jesus uh, died for us and God loves us. And that's about it. (laughs) Um, But the details and what those details in their proper context can teach us and form us into the image of Christ, you're kind of in a different world at that point. So, yeah, encouraging people to actually read it for themselves is a challenge. And I think it's a cultural epidemic of lack of uh, ability to focus. Mm -hmm. So we we can't focus on anything uh, because of the the digital age that we live in. And so the way the Bible, the text is presented, presents uh, a, a huge challenge to focus. Uh, something that that's hard for us. Well, um, any other uh, points on just the, the current state of education and um, maybe successes? I think well, actually we've talked about some of that. Let me uh, move on just for the sake of time to talking about the books in particular that uh, Regnum Media is uh, uh, is producing this year, twenty twenty three, and um, kind of the how it addresses some of these needs, how we see uh, these books as being part of the solution or uh, what's going on in congregations. So uh, talk a little bit about that and how you envision these books uh, being used and what do we have coming out, all that. Um, Kevin, maybe I'll talk kind of in general about kind of the series we're looking at, and then you could maybe talk about some of the books. Um, sure. So... I guess the broad question, there's this baked in assumption that God's word revealed in scripture is good for us. Um, and that mm. uh, if we if we, if we we read this and understand it well and seek to incorporate it into our, our lives, that blessing will come from that. Um, now, that's obviously a, not a controversial statement uh, theoretically for, for Christians, um, but it is one that's kind of baked into this entire project, right? Um, but uh currently uh Regna Media is working to uh introduce two different series and all of these books at least currently should be thought of in terms of hey this is stuff that churches could pick up and use um you could either teach straight from this or you could use it as a resource as you're trying to prepare to teach on this certain topic um, also, though, for individual Christians who are just interested in studying this on their own, so they're written to to cover both both needs. Um, one series, and this is the one that is uh, kind of our what we're leading off with, and um, more of our projects are in this area right now, is the uh, Biblia series, um, and that's basically just textual studies of different books of the Bible, um, and those different books have certain uh, elements that are uh, consistent throughout the series. And so uh, you'll have, you know, relevant biblical text uh, in there with commentary on that kind of explanation of what's going on. But you also have kind of some special features. Um, So for example, uh, there are some sections uh, which we were calling closer look sections. So uh, as you're studying something, there might be um, some historical background that would be really helpful to know, or maybe something with the original languages, or or something where uh, actually, um, if you if you know your Bibles well, you know that this instance and this text is actually kind of linked to another text somewhere else. And so these are maybe optional sections that wouldn't necessarily have to be uh, taught, but kind of just provide further illumination. And so that's that's another thing that we're trying to do, where we're trying to make scholarship accessible to the 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 average. Christian in the pew. And so um, we, we provide some of those things. Uh, another feature is we try to have discussion questions throughout the lesson. Um, so in terms of uh, this being more than just information dump, uh, you know, processing what we're what we're hearing uh, in, in Bible class or what we're reading um, and being able to kind of interact with that and dialogue and discuss and put that into our own words and, and interact with it. Um, 
we think, uh, Kevin and I think that, that enhances the Bible class experience. And so, um, so we try to provide discussion questions and not just all at the end. Sometimes you'll see resources and you'll have like eight discussion questions at the end. What that means though is maybe we get to those or maybe we don't, uh, depending on how long winded the the instructor is. And then also like if we get to them, maybe those questions are asking about things that we actually talked about, you know, 42 minutes ago at the beginning of class and you don't even really remember. And so we, we've tried to sp spread that out to, to um, make those discussions better, but also just improve the overall experience. Um, and then at the end of the lessons, we offer uh, what we call discipleship prompts. And so uh, something I am sensitive to in all my talk of how, boy, I really think we need to study our, our Bibles more. It's very possible to, to do that and get better information in your head, but it kind of stops there. And really, we're not interested in just becoming really good at knowing stuff about the Bible. We're interested in growing as disciples of Jesus. And so we try to end the lessons with, with some sort of practical exercise. Um, so, for example, if we were, uh, you know, say studying the Sermon on the Mount or something, well, okay, Jesus says to love your enemies. Who's someone in, in my life that... I might regard as an enemy and what does it look like for me to love that person? What's the first step to take? Do that this week, you know, something uh, intensely practical, but that if we were actually to do these things would result in positive steps on the path of discipleship. You started um, with, you illustrated with the hardest discipleship prompt uh, <laughs> in the Bible. Well, <laughs> That's good. We are about high, we are about high <laughs> standards here. Uh, no. right. So, so uh, th those are just kind of some common features, um, and that's that's in the Biblia series. Uh, another series that we're looking at is the uh, Doctrina. My, my Latin is actually not great, but um, basically topical theological studies, um, key ethical issues, uh, things that need to be addressed as well. And so, trying to trying to in, in a similar fashion, not not identical, but really kind of a, a similar sort of. Uh, layout for those books, but more topical in nature rather than textual. Um, and we've got several uh, several projects in the works, um, four in the Biblia series, one in the Doctrine series, and uh, Kevin maybe wants to share, share anything you want about those the, kind of those broader ideas, but maybe some of those specific projects as well. Um, specifically referring to some of the features in the Biblia series, I'm... I'm particularly excited about just the simple adjustment of moving uh, end of chapter discussion questions and integrating them throughout the body of the whole chapter. Um, I've shown I've shown a number of the people at a uh, people at my church my my class notes and um, and I've shown some friends also that their color color coded for you know having questions are one color scripture to read in class is another color and like major points of application are in a third color and that way at a moment's glance i can see kind of how how diversified is my lesson for that particular uh, class period and um i like to fairly evenly it it just so happens that it turns out this way a lot of times, but fairly evenly spaced throughout the lesson, I have open and discussion questions to generate conversation and reflection on the material. And that's, mm -hmm. that's to me, just, just the art of learning how to ask good questions can, uh, can, um, you know, r really get some people thinking about things in ways that they hadn't ever thought about before. And, and then by extension, uh, reflecting on material and and experiencing uh, Christian growth and maturity, and so that that just as a Bible class teacher, um, I'm teaching two different Bible classes a week, and I, I do that most weeks of the year. Um, in addition to my adjunct duties, that is going to be, I think, a really helpful feature. Um, and so, with some of the projects that we've got coming up, uh, Luke has. Luke has done a great job putting together uh, something that Todd alluded to earlier, uh, some study material on Ecclesiastes. And, and you know, it's what I, I, I'll admit, Ecclesiastes is not usually a fan favorite. Um, <laughs> you know, yet I, I I'm I'm saddened 
there are just so many great books in the Old Testament that people don't realize they're actually that good. At almost every day in class that I've been teaching for this quarter, I'll ask anybody, okay, show of hands, whose favorite book of the Old Testament is, and I'll name some book of the Old Testament. And none of them raise their hands. I, I don't know why Leviticus has such a bad rap, but, <laughs> but I mentioned Ecclesiastes the other day, and one guy showed, raised his hand. But uh, Luke's done a great job here with uh, his uh, the, the very first uh, publication for Regna Media coming out uh, within the next month or so, The Search for Significance, a study of Ecclesiastes. And um, I think that's going to be that's going to be a great a great tool for people to take what is a, a very thought provoking book and to make it accessible for church audiences. Um, I have used a previous version of slightly different material from Luke on Ecclesiastes. And I did my own tweaks here and there because I was not teaching a teen audience, but I was teaching an adult audience that material elsewhere Luke had done with Ecclesiastes was for a teen audience several years ago. And it was still a, a very rewarding experience, not just as a teacher, but I, I could tell that, uh, the folks in my Bible class really enjoyed that as well. Um, additionally, I am uh, I am authoring uh, sharing in his suffering a study of Philippians, and um, and Philippians is just is so rich. You know, a lot of people know that beautiful section there, often referred to as you know, the Christ hymn in Philippians chapter two, um, and and I hope to show within that book something that Paul does pretty regularly, which is to um, to teach doctrine for the purpose of ethical formation. Paul, Paul, Paul never just throws this out there as, you know, here's some interesting reflection on the nature of Christ and the, the incarnation and his ascension, but it's it's always for a very practical purpose. And I think that's something that can get lost. And so I, I, I'll very clearly point back to that because at one point or another through almost every chapter, well, all four chapters in Philippians, Paul alludes to that and alludes to the same same general uh, downward and upward movement of Christ in most of all his letters. So uh, Paul invented discipleship props. <laughs> right. That's um, maybe, uh, maybe if you think Paul invented Christianity, you might argue that Jesus <laughs> okay, okay, okay. invented discipleship prompts. Speaking of Jesus, Alan Black, <laughs> uh, um, professor of uh, New Testament at Harding School of Theology, is uh, is authoring Following Jesus, a Study of Mark. And um, I- I'm really, really excited about this one because there are, there are few people uh, that I know, a few scholars and teachers that I know who know the Gospel of Mark as well as Alan Black does. He has been teaching the Gospel of Mark off and on for some 30 years and has uh, written a a solid commentary on the Gospel of Mark in another series. Um, And I'm looking forward to his material on this. And then Lance Hawley is, uh, is coming out with Walking with Wisdom, a study of Proverbs. And I have taught through Proverbs before, I I think generally it was well received, but now I would be, you know, if I had had that material in hand, I'd be all the more excited about getting to teach Proverbs because Lance's expertise is uh, is wisdom literature, and we've got uh, on in upcoming projects we've talked to Lance about some other things um, that he's interested in doing uh, with us, and and so we're I, I won't. I'll just tease those now, but I won't go into detail about those. But these four books, um, you know, two from the Old Testament, two from the New Testament, I I think they're going to give some some very solid offerings to people who are just interested in, in knowing Scripture better, knowing God's story better. But also, we're going to give some really substantive material to Bible class teachers who are looking for something that they can they can rely on and um, something that's going to going to be a real help to them. Good. Yeah. Um, 
it was, so we've got four coming out uh, this year, um, 62 to go or something like that. Right? <laughs> uh, more to come. Uh, I don't, will we, Luke, will we do a whole book on second John? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> word okay. by word study. Yeah. <laughs> 61 to go all right uh but uh no that's great um y'all have mentioned some of the features that i think are really going to set this series apart uh from other curriculum materials that might be out there um the, just the you know uh, basic commentary um knowledge of the original languages but coming out in an accessible way um the uh, discipleship prompts, the discussion questions throughout, all of this is going to make it very user-friendly for people um, who are faced with that challenge of, I have class to teach on Sunday, all right? And here is, the, this is going to be the go-to uh, for that. When I think of other curriculum material that's out there, though, um, particularly in Churches of Christ, but maybe even uh, broader, um, I think one of the things that sets this apart is that uh, what we have is a motto for the center, and that is uh, scholarship for the church, that everyone who's writing uh, these books, as I said, has a knowledge of the original languages. They've got, they, they uh, know the commentary literature. They know the historical backgrounds. They know about this book that they're writing about, everything that you would want the expert author to know about on this. But these are all people who uh, are involved as well in the life of the church, who have experienced teaching, who've been teaching those Sunday school classes for a long time and know what's needed. And so uh, reliable scholarship, but made uh, accessible. So it's not sectarian, it's not polemical, um, but it really gets uh, to the heart of what each biblical book is uh, trying to say What and what God's Spirit is trying to teach us in this. So I'm excited about uh, these books. Uh, we also have um, one book so far that's going to be coming out in the Doctrina series um, by John Mark Hicks on uh, baptism, Lord's Supper, and the assembly. So those uh, five, uh, those will be our first uh, five books. And Really excited about this. Anything else to say about this Bible study and curriculum material before we start wrapping this up? I, I would just like to emphasize again um, the importance of taking the best of relevant scholarship and making it accessible to the church. There are there are popular ways of getting that kind of material if you can luck out and find uh, you'll find a worthwhile interview of you know somebody like a, a Ben Witherington type figure on you know CNN or or something like that that I know he's he's done stuff for them in the past uh, on Easter or you know, Christmas or something like that um but there's scholarship is kind of like the internet you can get a real a lot of really good stuff out there and you can get a lot of stuff that's just useless out there and it's and if you're not if you're not in that world or you don't have even just a foot in that world it's easy to get lost and it's easy to um easy to find some things that are old, are either unhelpful or worse uh, very damaging mm -hmm. and so one of the one of the main things that Luke and I wanted to do, and I know Keith, you and Todd have have been insistent upon this as well for your own work in the the various media in which y'all operate and with Center for Christian Studies, is that we wanted to find voices who could, um, like I said, take the best of relevant scholarship and make it accessible to church audiences because we know not everybody can do that on their own um, time and uh, capacities and, and all other manner of factors so work in that. And, and so that's that's one thing that just really gets me energized about this series is, you know, I, it also helps that I know all the authors personally, the ones we've just mentioned so far, and the ones that we're talking to 
behind the scenes. And I, I would absolutely buy material from them and, uh, and would, and would use it for classes. If I, if I had it, well, we're going to get it to where people can have that material. Yes. Excellent. Um, all right. Well, uh, Kevin, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you for a quick rundown of uh, something that came up in one of our conversations uh, previously and was puzzling to me. This is not something I learned in theology school, um, but you mentioned uh, as a just a side comment, something about Dragon Ball Z. Um, and I think the rest of us were bewildered uh, and just thought maybe you could give us a very quick rundown of what Dragon Ball Z is and why it's important for us to know about it. Yeah, I'm half expecting the seg segment to be edited out of the <laughs> of the episode. Now I'll also be. mention that I am the youngest here and um, may want to talk to the CCS board about the hazing that I'm experiencing. <laughs> 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 that they'd be on our side. So. That's right. <laughs> I, I should have known. I should have guessed. Um, Dragon Ball Z was a cartoon I watched 20 years ago. Oh, that is, <laughs> that's oh, a right. quick rundown. Thanks. All right. And uh, good versus evil. You know, there's good guys and bad guys. It's it was fun. Okay. <laughs> Still is. I watched Voltron when I was growing up. <laughs> ah, see, it is huh? GI yeah. Joe. I watched GI Joe. Real Luke, American hero. Luke, you're a big Ninja Turtles fan, right? Me too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Luke, do you have any cartoons that we've never heard of that you were a big fan of? Uh, I, I was significantly obsessed with Ducktales growing up. Yeah, yeah, tell me you know Ducktales. That's good I, stuff. I sort of know. Is that is that Donald Duck and his crew? Well, it's really like Scrooge McDuck is the main character. Donald's okay, yeah, a yeah, yeah, character. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> if you watch them as adults, uh, they, they still hit. Like they, they've got there's all this adult humor that you didn't pick up on when you were four, or in my case, um, but good stuff. Yeah. So okay, a adult humor in the sense that it like it's not it, lewd. Mm. <laughs> yeah, that's a, I want that's to a really, I want to emphasize that. Thank you. Really important clarification question. It's not yeah, it's, lewd it's totally appropriate, or crass. but it's o over the head of little kids. It yeah. is. It, it is uh, humor podcast intended okay. for. Yeah. It's the best. It's the best the sort of children's they're programming with their children. <laughs> yeah, it's the best sort of children's programming where children's can children children's children can appreciate it, and their parents can you know watch it with them and also not be bored to tears. So, okay, there are. Uh, that's the best kind. So. Uh, yeah. yeah, those are few and far between. So, That's right. look, uh, thank you, Kevin and Luke, for joining us uh, today for this podcast and particularly for um, just this collaboration on mm -hmm. these uh, books, the this curriculum material. Uh, and we're really excited about it. Yeah. Um, thank you, Todd, as always, uh, for being a part of this episode. And Thank you all for listening to Theological Table Talk, the podcast of the Center for Christian Studies. These books um, that are published by Regnum Media as an imprint of Center for Christian Studies are available on Amazon. That's probably the best place to go. Just search Regnum Media, Center for Christian Studies, the Biblia series, um, and you will also see them on our website at christian-studies.org. So check out our website, um, and if you would like, suggest topics, suggest guests, uh, email us, be in contact at info at christian-studies.org. And if you like what you see on the website or you like what you've heard today, uh, not only go and check out these uh, new books, but check out the Give button, which helps to sponsor our ministry. So thanks for joining us at the table. For Theological Table Talk. Until next time.